Hello, everybody. This is Dr. Al Hewer of a and Respiratory Lectures. I'm coming to you today to talk to you about inhaled flolon or epropostanol, a potent pulmonary vasodilator. I want to welcome you to this presentation and hope you derive a lot of useful information from it. Before getting started in earnest in this presentation, I want to acknowledge two of my colleagues, Mike Scolante of Atlantic Health and Juan Rivera of St. Joseph's Medical Center, both of whom provided some of the photographs that were used in this presentation. So let's kick off the presentation by describing the major learning objectives for it. We'll describe what flow line or epropostanol is, review its mechanism of action and how it works, summarize the indications and contraindications, review the equipment setup. There's actually more than one setup and we will review two of them, two of the most common ones, and how to administer it by a ventilator circuit. I'm stressing that point because there are similar drugs to flow line that can be inhaled, but they are, um, again, they would be more for spontaneous breathing patients that perhaps have pulmonary or secondary pulmonary hypertension, but are not sick enough to be on a ventilator. However, the main focus of this presentation is administering Flolon via a ventilator circuit. We'll also examine a, a, examine a few case applications, and in doing so, try to distinguish the pulmonary indications for Flolon versus the cardiac ones. And lastly, though perhaps most importantly, I'll be sharing some additional resources for those of you who may want to drill down more and learn more about this topic. So let's kick off the presentation by discussing what epropostanol is. So flowlon or epropostanol is a synthetic prostacycline, a sort of category of, of substances produced within the body, which relax vascular smooth muscle. In doing so, it results in vasodilation of the pulmonary and systemic vasculature in a dose-dependent manner. It will produce pulmonary results mainly when inhaled, but when given systemically, it'll produce more widespread effects, will affect systemic blood pressure. And it will do so when we say in a dose-dependent manner, the more is given, the more vasodilation will be achieved. Some of the major indications include pulmonary hypertension, acute right heart dysfunction, hypoxemia related to pulmonary vasoconstriction, such as that that we can see with diseases and conditions like ARDS and acute lung injury. In addition, it has an inhibitory effect on platelet aggregation. So we don't give these medications to uh, reduce platelet aggregation, but it's something to be aware of. It's also something to be aware of if a patient already has extended coag times, it can further worsen them. So it's something to be mindful of. And lastly, Flolon inhibits activation of leukocytes and monocytes, thus squelching the effect or reducing the effect of an inflammatory reaction. A little more on what inhaled epropostanol is, the research on it really started back in the early 1990s, and the initial studies were done on animals, most particularly dogs. And it was found that by delivering drugs like Flolon in an inhaled fashion to dogs, it did result in selective pulmonary artery vasodilation. It was also found that it causes selective pulmonary vas vasodilation, but it does not, not cause systemic hy uh, hy hypotension when it is given via an inhaled fashion. Some of the analog or synthetic uh, drugs that are similar to Flolon include um, Tybasco and uh, Iliprost. Those would be more medications that are not delivered via the ventilator circuit, but more commonly intermittently three, four times a day uh, by an in in inhaled fashion uh, for patients that have po uh, primary pulmonary hypertension, but they're again, not sick enough to be on ventilators. One other point I wanna make is that 
um, Flolon and uh, similar drugs are, um, they're, they're nebulized. They're actually a nebulized drug. They're not a medical gas like nitric oxide. Now, nitric oxide and uh, Flolon do have some similar indications, uh, but I wanted to make that distinction at the beginning of this presentation or near the beginning of it. So asking the question, what does it do? What does Flolon do? It causes marked pulmonary vasodilation when it's delivered via inhalation also does so by maintaining gas exchange and systemic arterial pressure. So again, when inhaled, doesn't have a lot of systemic effects. It's also a significant decrease in mean pulmonary artery pressures, or PAPs, without noticeable change in mean arterial pressure. So the second and the third bullet point on this slide certainly say that, you know, when given properly, when inhaled and set up, you know, properly, minimal, minimal uh, systemic effects, uh, but potentially significant pulmonary effects. The major indications for Flolon or epoprosinol or primary pulmonary hypertension can be utilized in conjunction with a ventricular assist device, most commonly a right uh, ventricular uh, assist device to combat right ventricular dysfunction, um, really to try to alleviate by, by dilating those pulmonary uh, vessels. It will actually reduce the right heart preload and can enhance uh, uh, cardiac output as a result. Postoperatively, can be used to reduce pulmonary uh, artery pressures, um, allowing the heart to rest and recover and heal. Uh, so what they'll do sometimes with coronary artery bypassing graft, graft or cabbage surgery is they'll use Flolon or use inhaled nitric oxide to allow uh, those uh, grafts to have less pressure exerted on them and uh, you know, better conditions for healing. Flolon can also be used to treat a low ejection fraction of uh, less than 20 to 25%, um, which is where a lot of patients start feeling a lot of uh, a diminished uh, capacity for uh, you know, activities of daily living. So it's not a cure, um, but you can maybe get five or 10% more uh, ejection fraction by using medications like Flolon or cousin drugs like T Tabasco um, on an intermittent uh, basis. Not curative, but maybe a bridge until the patient can get a, a ventricular assist device or um, even um, something like a heart transplant. Um, one of the common indications as a respiratory therapist that, that we see, however, are uh, we use flow line in the treatment of hypoxemia secondary to uh, ARDS or acute respiratory distress syndrome or uh, acute lung injury, where you have kind of widespread areas of the lung that are not well ventilated and the body will constrict the the blood flow to those areas in order to try to, to, try to um, if you will, equilibrate the VQ mismatch. So to improve a VQ mismatch. The problem is the V is low because of the ARDS, but then when you're also reducing the blood flow or the Q part of that equation, you have a, you have a better matched VQ, but it's very low at the same time. So it's a bad combination. So by reversing some of that vasoconstriction um, some of the, you know, we, we see it in terms of improved oxygenation in those patients. So one of the questions that's often asked is uh, the similarities or differences between Flolon and inhaled nitric oxide. So there are similarities between these two medications. They have a, a roughly comparable um, beneficial effect on pulmonary vasodilation again, without affecting systemic uh, vasculature. The aim is, again, reducing pulmonary artery pressures, reducing pulmonary vascular resistance, thus resulting in improved oxygenation. There, however, is insufficient data or are insufficient data showing increased survival for ARDS patients. Yet another question that's asked is, relates to, are there advantages of Flolon over inhaled nitric oxide? So the delivery systems are, uh, tend to be relatively simple, and most things are simple if you understand them. But you know, you know, inhaled nitric oxide is, a lot of the work is, is front-loaded, and once it's all set up, there's not really a lot to do except for monitor the patient carefully, maybe titrate, change the tanks, et cetera. Um, when it comes to uh, um, in, inhaled flow line, there's probably more 
kind of ongoing maintenance of changing filters and things along those lines, syringes and that sort of thing, things we'll talk about later in this presentation. But they're relatively, both setups are relatively straightforward. Um, the drug is generally available from most hospitals and it's on formulary, um, again, than uh, then inhaled nitric oxide. Um, much less expensive. So the medication itself is much less expensive than nitric oxide. However, you do have the kind of ongoing issues of the labor, you know, associated with, you know, changing filters and, you know, getting uh, replacement syringes and, and replacing the syringes, et cetera, et cetera. So the drug is less expensive. The setup and, and the maintenance for the setup is probably a little bit more. Um, in balance, it's probably, you know, the from a financial perspective, um, a flow line is probably a better, you know, a better, a less expensive medication um, than nitric oxide, but they're both very, very effective. Data tend to support overall effectiveness in a clinical setting for treating, again, pulmonary hypertension and vasoconstriction associated with uh, ARDS. One of the other questions that's uh, asked or, or, uh, or relates to are there cost differences between flow line and nitric oxide? And indeed, um, there are the cost of a, a nitric oxide for hospitals and facilities that have an unlimited plan can be in that range of $100 to $200 an hour when you actually add up the hours of, of usage um, versus about $200 to $220 a day. This is the cost for the medication. Epropostanol does lack the toxic effects and metabolites of nitric oxide and therefore does not uh, need a complicated delivery system. Okay, so um, and, and in reality, I, I'm not saying the ionovent, or, you know, that's the that's the device that's used to deliver uh, inhaled nitric oxide is complex, um, but it's certainly you know it, it it's it takes a little bit to to, to set up. To, you know, it takes you a good 10 or 15 minutes to actually set everything up and you know do you know run the controls and prepare it for use. Um, the the um, flow line also has its issues with setup, but it's more of an ongoing thing with changing filters and changing syringes and things along those lines. So those need to be uh, honestly factored into the uh, cost as well. It's not just the cost of the drug, but it's the cost of the actual setup and the maintenance that's required for it as well. e or flow line can inhibit platelet uh, aggregation. So it's not why we give the medication, but it's something to be aware of. And flow line uh, does not bind with hemoglobin. Um, so there's no increase in risk for increase in meth hemoglobin levels. So that, that's another uh, nice feature. Just to be aware, however, just to reiterate that, you know, with the newer systems, the, the INO vents rarely, even though that we monitor uh, nitrogen dioxide, which again is a substance that's produced when nitric oxide and oxygen come in contact for extended periods of time, um, the real risk, the real risk to patients for meth hemoglobinemia with inhaled nitric oxide is, is low. The, the thing is, it's non-existent risk with inhaled nitric oxide. So again, um, uh, flow line or ufoprostanol has a favorable safety profile or risk to benefit uh, relationship. Rarely can it exacerbate hypotension, it's systemic hypotension and bleeding. Something to be aware of, but it's very uh, rare that it happens. More common side effects of flushing and headache are fairly common um, for those individuals that are that are taking either the uh, flow line or, uh, if you will, cousin you know analog drugs uh, that are similar to it. Um, however, the, the less common ones would include nausea and vomiting, anxiety, chest pain, and dizziness. Hypotension is occasionally reported, but again, you know these these are fairly benign um, you know complications and, and side effects. Um, but we included them here for the sake of uh, completeness. Now let's take a look at the research evidence. And again, just a couple of broad statements regarding it. So there's a limited but growing body of evidence or uh, if will, clinical research that relates to flow on. Many case reports and smaller studies. Many studies have had a small number of patient subjects few what we call experimental design that have both a control and a experimental group. Not all of the results may be attributable to flow line, and there's incomplete data for some of the variables such as, um, you know, uh, pulmonary vascular resistance, wedge pressure, central venous pressure, and other uh, hemodynamic findings. So some of the earlier research 
was done by um, Rabinovich and others, 2011. It was published in Chest Physician, it's a review article, and it determined that inhaled flow line or epoprostenol is as effective as inhaled nitric oxide for short-term management of pulmonary hypertension and impaired oxygenation. Also concluded that it has potentially fewer side effects than uh, inhaled nitric oxide, lower costs, greater ease of administration, which again is a bit debatable because again, the, the administration or the setup is, is kind of labor intensive with inhaled nitric oxide, but once it's all set up, it's pretty much, you know, you're, you're titrating doses, you're, you're uh, changing tanks and that's pretty much it. With, with flow line, you're, you're doing more, changing filters, changing syringes, et cetera. So it's a bit uh, debatable. Further randomized control studies are needed was also concluded in this project. More on the earlier research, DeWitt and others in 2004 published the results from a prospective interventional study of 126 cardiothoracic patients with pulmonary hypertension. And just skipping to the second uh, sub bullet here, determined that there was a significant improvement in P to F ratio in such patients that had refra refractory hypoxemia. Hache in 2001 did a retrospective, so looking backward, chart review of 27 patients who received Flolon over a one year period and concluded that a selective pulmonary vasodilation occurred in 78% of the patients and a statistically significant improvement in P to F ratio occurred in 88%. And they overall concluded that inhaled flow line can be useful in the treatment of patients with pulmonary hypertension and severe concomitant hypoxia. Let's take a, a, a quick peek at the evidence related to children in neonates. So Krushnan and others published a piece in 2012 that basically said that inhaled uh, flow line or epoprostenol improves exercise capacity and World Health Organization functional class in children and had an acceptable safety profile. Brown and others in the same year concluded that inhaled epoprostenol is effective in treating pulmonary hypertension in pediatric patients, but maybe more so for neonates. And Dahlin and others in 2004 published a randomized control trial, and it indicated that the results suggest that aerosolized flow line improves oxygenation in children with acute lung injury, but further went on to say that additional trials are needed to support whether or not this conclusion is in fact true. Looking at some of the more recent evidence, uh, Buckley in 2021 <clears throat> did a fairly powerful retrospective. So retrospective review or cohort study is looking uh, backwards, um, looking at historical trends of 239 patients who were all 18 years old or older um, with moderate to severe ARDS. And they found that uh, fixed dose flow line was comparable to inhaled nitric oxide in patients um, who, you know, again, had moderate to severe ARDS. Um, and it did improve oxygenation and some other hemodynamic parameters as well. Um, CRC in 2015, um, if you will, um, determined that inhaled nitric oxide and flow line have similar efficacy profiles. However, they differ with respect to cost and ease of administration. So it's kind of an interesting piece if you want to see some of the uh, dissection of some of the nuance regarding cost and ease of uh, administration. Uh, the CERC piece is a, a, a worthwhile um, one to look at. Looking at flow lines, potential use in patients that have severe hypoxemia secondary to COVID, um, in 2021, Santi and others uh, uh, published a piece where they had done, again, another one of these retrospective observational studies where they're, again, looking, um, if you will, backward on recent electronic health record results um, at those who received inhaled uh, epoprostenol or Flolon, um, who, again, were on mechanical ventilation and um, had moderate to severe uh, hypoxemia secondary to ARDS. 50% um, of the patients on inhaled flow line had clinically significant improvement in P to F ratios. And they re this really pointed to suggesting that it is worthwhile trying as a rescue therapy, although the benefit was modest and, and, and somewhat variable. Um, those who were prone um, and received 
uh, flow line had even uh, you know a more profound uh, response and were more likely to um, to improve particularly their p to f ratios there's a team of uh, researchers and clinicians at massachusetts general hospital and they really looked at both uh, inhaled nitric oxide and flow lines use in individuals that had respiratory failure secondary to COVID-19 and were receiving mechanical ventilation. And they uh, you know, made some, if you will, determinations as a result of their studies. And one of them was that inhaled nitric oxide should be reserved as a rescue therapy for persistent hypoxemia. And they uh, defined it as uh, SAO2 of less than 90% or the PAO2 of less than 60 TOR which is unresponsive to conventional or more conventional uh, therapies such as PEEP titration and prone ventilation. They further stated that inhaled nitric oxide is preferred to Flolon, principally because Flolon is nebulized and requires an uh, inline filter, actually you know, one or more inline filters on the expiratory limb that must be changed periodically because Flolon has such a viscous or if you will, sticky buffer. Uh, and that stickiness can actually clog those filters, so they need to be changed every two to three hours, uh, sometimes more frequently than that. And again, these filter changes and other quote unquote maintenance issues increase the number of times that number one, the ventilator circuit uh, needs to be opened, and number two, the number of times that individuals such as respiratory therapists need to actually go into the room, which of course increases the risk of, of viral transmission to the staff. Regarding the actual setup and usage of Flowlon, extremely important that it be continued in transit. So as I alluded to earlier, the, um, the effects of Flowlon are completely resolved in about 24 minutes. So it has a very short half-life. So the idea is this, that if the patient needs it, it needs it, it needs, it needs to be continued during transit, whether that transit be uh, in a hospital from you know, the unit to the, to the CAT scan and back, you know, often that will take um, you know, in the range of you know, 30 to 45, even 60 minutes. Um, so the setup really needs to be continued during transit. Um, if, it, likewise, if it's a external trans, uh, you know, transportation to a different um, facility, um, you know, accommodations need to be made to continue to flow on uh, during it as well. And then if you're using a setup that, that, that um, employs a mini heart nebulizer versus an aerogen, you need to have, make sure that you have a, a tank, an oxygen tank to actually drive the nebulizer um, during transport in addition to whatever your oxygen needs are um, for the actual ventilator itself. Regarding the storage of, of flow on, um, it will be received from pharmacy in most facilities in the appropriate strength. Um, it will typically come up in a, a, a brown uh, a plastic bag because um, Flolon is light labile, so you need to protect it from light during storage as well as when you actually have it in the, um, in the syringe pump um, or in the mini heart nebulizer, depending upon which setup you use, which I'll be talking about later in this presentation. It needs to be um, also stored in a refrigerator. Um, and the reason for that is, again, it, um, it's also heat labile. Um, so as it warms the room temperature, it will uh, lose its uh, effectiveness. Um, it, it can be uh, kept out of the, and utilized out of the refrigerator for up to eight hours. When initiating or starting subsequent treatment, always confirm that there's an additional vial of, of uh, evoposanol or Flolon. Uh, as I alluded to earlier, it, uh, its entire um, effects will be resolved within about 24 minutes of discontinuation. Um, you know, therefore, you just want to make sure that you have an, a, an extra vial or two or syringe or two of it, because if there's an inadvertent uh, disruption, such as uh, the, the uh, syringe inadvertently comes out of the syringe pump because somebody bumped into it or something along those lines, the actual IV pole topples over, something you know dramatic or not so dramatic. You just want to make sure that you can actually replace that lost vial very, very quickly and minimize any disruption uh, of administration of medication. Because the uh, Flowon uh, solution has what's called a glycine buffer, 
okay it's a, it's it's added to the actual solution um it, it the glycine buffer is sticky it's viscous it's sticky um, and that means a couple of things it means number one that filters need to be uh, added to the expiratory limb and i'll show you some some photos some images um, in the next several slides of what that looks like i typically will add two i call one of them the sacrificial one in case it does become clogged you can literally just pull that one out and reconnect it because you still have another filter um, better yet is to change those filters every two to three hours um, some of the guidance will say as long as four hours, but I like to try to stay ahead of the sheriff, um, so to speak, and, and, and be changing them frequently and have a bag of those filters at bedside. Um, what I do as a matter of practice, this is not a clinical practice guideline, but I will also show the nurse um, how to actually change the filter. In general, I'm not a big fan of having nurses and doctors touch the ventilator, ventilator circuit. This is an exception because you may be in a, another patient's room in the ICU um, and the severe occlusion occurs and you need to have somebody else in that unit who knows how to actually change that, uh, change that filter. When that happens with, for instance, a 980, a COVIDian 980 ventilator, the screen will, it'll alarm and the screen will say severe occlusion. Patient's still getting ventilated, at least initially, but um, very important that that filter be changed very quickly and better uh, to have a second person in the unit who could actually do so. Um, the other thing that you need to, um, need to be mindful of is that ventilatory pressures may vary due to the nebulized flow. So if you use a setup that, that where you're not using aerogen, where you're actually using a mini heart nebulizer, you just need to you know, be mindful that um, you know, you're, you're adding additional flow into that circuit and you're adding additional volume. Um, so you may need to make some adjustments uh, along those lines and certainly be aware of that. In this presentation, I will be describing um, two different setups. One of them involves the use of a mini heart nebulizer. And in, in general, when you're using a mini heart, the, um, the medication will come up in, um, in three different strengths. One is 10 micrograms per milliliter, one's five, and then um, 2.5. The initial dose, just like the initial dose for inhaled nitric oxide is, is typically 20 parts per million, the initial dose for flow line is 10 micrograms per milliliter, um, again, at eight milliliters per hour, just get, you know, them getting that particular volume. Um, so you're adding 24 milliliters of the drug into the mini heart nebulizer, inserting the nebulizer into the inspiratory limb of the circuit Y, as I'll be showing you in the next several slides covering a nebulizer um, with, uh, you know, a, a the part of the brown bag that it came up in because a uh, flow line is light sensitive and running the actual flow to the, to the mini heart nebulizer at two liters per minute. As promised, this photo uh, shows the, uh, the mini heart uh, nebulizer and it being in the inspiratory limb. Note that there's a, a 50 ml piece of corrugated tubing between the T piece um, where the mini heart is and the actual Y itself. The other highly significant part of this uh, image is it's showing an expiratory uh, filter. It's near the Y. Now I will tell you that the expiratory filter does not have to be located near the Y. This is where this one is located. You could also put two, you know, whether it be here or whether it be right, right at the, um, where, where the uh, expiratory limb goes into the uh, ventilator itself. But again, my recommendation would be to actually put two of these filters. Um, the one that's, if you will, uh, closest to the, to the Y would be the sacrificial one. So for instance, if you do get a message that says severe occlusion, just temporarily, you could take the one of the two filters out of line uh, quickly um, and you'd see that that would be resolved. Uh, but the key is there that you'd have to then, or you should then go back and, and add that second, a clean second filter in there as well. Um, you know, to, to try to stave off um, any sort of uh, issues with the glycine buffer returning back into the ventilator, doing all kinds of things, potentially causing uh, auto peep and just, you know, causing a, a ventilator malfunction. So by setting it up this way, number one, with the cover, you're protecting the flow line. And number two, with these filters, you're actually protecting the, the ventilator. Um, and you could say protecting the patient from um, any sort of interruption of their ventilation due to um, an issue in the expiratory limb. So this image is really showing you um, the, the view of the setup um, from a bit of a distance. Um, the disadvantage is everything looks smaller. The advantage is you're actually getting an idea, a better idea of where things are located. This particular image on the left hand, I'm going to call it kind of near uh, rather right hand, uh, upper right hand, you see the actual blender there. 
Um, the blender would be actually feeding the flow that's going to the mini heart nebulizer set at an FiO2 that's equivalent to whatever the FiO2 is uh, going to the patient itself. But just to kind of reiterate, you can kind of see where the mini heart is. You could see, you know, the, the actual T piece and the extra piece of corrugated, as well as the filter um, that's, you know, that's, that's near the, the actual Y itself. And if you follow that expiratory limb all the way back into or near where it's entering the, the ventilator, the expiratory limb, you'll see there's another filter there as well. So again, little less um, of an issue of where you locate those filters in the expiratory limb, uh, but more important that there be two of them there and that you be aware that they need to be changed about every two to three hours. Note also that um, we did take the cover off of the mini heart nebulizer to show you this actual setup, but normally there would be, you know, brown plastic or something similar to it around the mini heart nebulizer in order to protect it from light, the flow line from light. This image just complements the, the prior one, and it's really focusing a little bit more side view here, showing you a, a better view of the actual uh, the blender itself with the flow meter there. And not that you can see it exactly, but the, the, the actual oxygen tubing is going back. That's coming from the, um, you know, from the blender set at the FIO2 to match what the vent settings are. Um, that tubing is actually driving the, the mini heart nebulizer. And as I said, for, you know, most notably um, situating the flow at, at two liters a minute in order to achieve the desired dose. In this photo, we're seeing the, what I'm calling the alternate setup. I will tell you that more recently, we've, we've been using a lot more, uh, almost exclusively actually, the alternate setup with the, with the Aerogen and the, uh, the syringe pump. Um, so it's Medfusion, I'm not promoting that particular syringe pump, uh, uh, but Medfusion syringe pump with an Aerogen controller. So it's really giving you an idea, not of the actual interfacing with the ventilator itself, but showing you the Aerogen syringe pump um, set up right here. The, the uh, syringe is actually not inserted in the syringe pump yet, but you'll see in the next image, it actually is. This photo is actually showing you where the, uh, the actual uh, Aerogen T piece, if you will, um, is inserted uh, with regard to the ventilator circuit. And though um, this is kind of a close up here, it would be located on the dry side okay, the dry side of the circuit, of the humidifier, you know, in relation to the circuit. So by the dry side, just for clarity's sake, we mean the side of the humidifier that's in between the ventilator and the humidifier itself. Um, and again, at first, when this, when this recommendation first came out, it was over a decade ago, it seemed a little bit counterintuitive. I can assure you that all uh, subsequent, you know, research and clinical trials have, have endorsed the fact that this is where um, this is the proper location of the aerogen in relation to the ventilator circuit. Typically is as well um, where you're aerosolizing other medications such, such as uh, albuterol, continuous albuterol and things along those lines. This is showing you a broader view of a more uh, complete depiction of the, again, what I'm calling the alternate or the aerogen syringe pump setup. So you'll see on the left hand side, of, of this uh, photo, you'll see the actual uh, syringe pump, you'll see the syringe in the syringe pump, and just crudely, it looks like the syringe is maybe a half to two thirds filled. Um, you'll see the aerogen controller there as well. And then following, if it's a little hard to see, but there's actually, um, it's not clear tubing, it's, it, it's partially clear, but it also has a blue stripe um, that's actually feeding a continuous feed into the aerogen. And that would that whole setup by the humidifier there is in the lower right hand side of this image. Um, again, a little bit because this is a kind of a, a broader uh, perspective, it's a you know a little bit more difficult to see the, 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 the fine details here. But again, the aerogen is on the dry side of the uh, of the humidifier. So it is again in between the um, the ventilator and the humidifier itself. Um, again, and just crudely put, um, the syringes themselves, depending upon the actual dosages, and I'll be going over the dosages um, shortly. If it's full dose for, for an adult male, uh, typically the, the actual uh, syringe itself will last somewhere in that eight hour range, give or take seven, eight hour range, something along those lines. But I'll be talking a little bit more about that in the ensuing slides. Several slides back, I showed you the dosing uh, that would be utilized when you're using a mini heart uh, nebulizer. 
Um, and that dosing again was either 10 for full strength, five or 2.5 um, you know, uh, micrograms per milliliter. Um, likewise, likewise with the alternative dosing, the alternative dosing with the, uh, if you will, continuous um, feed into the aerogen. Many hospitals now are using a single strength, a single strength of Flolon in the syringe, and they're varying the dose by the flow with the syringe pump. So I'll repeat again. So rather than using that 10.5, 2.5, okay, they're, you know, which think about it, that if, if a doctor orders, um, you know, that, that the patient be reduced from, from 10 to five in the, you know, in the prior setup that I described, you, you're gonna need to get a new syringe from the pharmacy at that lower strength. So in the alternative dosing that I'm describing in, in this slide, that's not necessary. What you would do would be adjust the flow from the syringe pump, okay? So the three strengths under this scenario are either 50 nanograms per kilogram per minute, 25, or 10 nanograms per kilogram per minute. And then you'll see, so you have a table here looking at the uh, vertical, the, the, the left-hand side, the vertical uh, axis, if you will, you go from 40 to 70 to greater than 100 kilogram of uh, ideal body weight individual. Okay, so let's go right to the 70. I'm probably closer to 80, quite honestly, but I'm just, you know, for, for the sake of, you know, just kind of rule of thumb. So you have a 70 kilogram male at full strength at 50 nanograms per kilogram per minute. The flow rate that's set on the syringe pump would be seven. Okay, so it's seven milliliters per hour. Um, and you're, you're typically going to have a, uh, the syringe pump, the syringe itself will come up from pharmacy at, even though it's in a 60 ml syringe, it will typically come up at with, with 50. Um, so again, just for kind of rule of thumb, you're really looking at a, um, you know, a duration you know, that, that the syringe will last, you know, in that seven, eight hour range. You just, you just got to keep on top of it. You just got to be monitoring it carefully. Um, and you can just, you know, kind of extrapolate it from there. Um, you can actually just, you know, a lo lot of information in, in this uh, little table here. But one of the things that you can do is note on the left hand side from 40 uh, kilograms, ideal body weight to 100. Go all the way from the left hand side to the right hand side. So left hand side, 40 to 100 kgs. Right hand side, you'll notice at full strength for a 40 kilogram, it's a flow rate of four. 50 kilogram flow rate of five. 60 kilogram flow rate of six. So there's, you know, there's a lot, you know, a lot of numbers on this on this slide. Kind of, you almost got to say, what am I looking at here? But if you think of kind of a, you know, just for your own mind's eye, you know, ideal body weight, full strength. The um, if you just take a zero out of the out of the number of kilograms, that'll give you your your flow rate uh, for full dose. So weaning a flow line, just like we wean inhaled nitric oxide. Um, the patient looks like they're more stable and the, the reasons why they were put on, it seemed like they're resolving. They're not totally resolved, but they're resolving. Titrating the medication, again, for, um, for the original setup I described would be, again, from 10 to 5 to 2.5 micrograms per milliliter. Uh, and again, monitoring the patient, you know, looking when, when you go from 10 to 5, you know, looking at their oxygenation, it may dip a little bit and then, then rebound nicely. Um, but if it goes down precipitously, let's say they're satting at 94 when they're on full strength and you turn them down to five and then, you know, 45 minutes later, their saturations are now 84 and it looks like a real number, maybe you do a blood gas and the PO2 correlates with it, then it may be best to go back to the 10. Uh, again, alternatively, using the other setup that I just described, um, going from 50 to 25 to 10 nanograms per kilogram per minute. Titration, of course, should be reconsidered. Uh, and the physician contacted if a patient demonstrates an increase in PA pressures, you know, which again, a lot of patients do not necessarily have swan gans in place unless you work in a cardiac setting. Um, but, you know, that, you know, and or in particular, if there's a decrease in, in oxygenation, I said earlier that the, uh, the, the effects of flow line resolve in about 24 or 25 minutes. So if it's 30, 40 minutes later, and it looks like they're not having a good response to it, then you know, get that uh, dose uh, turned back up and monitor the patient very carefully. Regarding the uh, termination of epoposanol or flow line, you would need an order, just like to titrate down, you really need an order 
to do so. The order may come in the form of an, a pre-approved protocol, okay? But again, you need to go within whatever the guidelines are at the facility or organization in which you work. Uh, order to discontinue the medication must be obtained prior to the actual dis discontinuation itself. Um, again, to reiterate, if pulmonary artery pressures uh, and or oxygenation um, or compromise, they should be monitored, but if they're compromised in any way, really, you know, if your PA pressure start going back up high to, you know, let's say, you know, they were on, uh, prior to setting up the flow line, you know, 55 over 35 on flow line, they were, you know, 35 over, you know, 20 or something along those lines. And now they're, you know, starting to rebound back to, you know, 55 over 35 or something along those lines. Um, then you'd need to really reconsider the whole the whole episode. Uh, as I mentioned, you know, flow lines uh, effect is completely resolved in about 24 minutes. In the event of elevated PA pressure, deterioration of oxygenation, resumption should be strongly considered. And the, you know, again, some of the protocols will actually allow the uh, the, cl the clinicians, the RT, and the nurse to actually do that. Um, but best to absolutely keep the physician, the pre prescribing physician, in the loop um, and uh, make sure that they're aware because there's some additional measures that they may want to take as well. Now let's examine a couple of cases for the use of Flowlon. Now earlier in the presentation, I talked about you know two of the main categories or indications would be cardiac, and the other main one would be respiratory. They're not the only two, but those are the two main ones. So first case we're going to look at uh, involves a, a patient with cardiac compromise. So you have a 69-year-old male with a history of cardiomyopathy, whether it be through repeated uh, you know, heart attacks or some other pathology. Patient is intubated, mechanically ventilated uh, due to his severe exacerbation of congestive heart failure or CHF. He currently has a Swan-Gans catheter in place. His cardiac output is uh, 2.9, so really marginally low. What's uh, particularly disconcerting is that the patient's pulmonary artery pressures are, again, crudely put, or you know, double or more than double what, what you would expect. So 52 over 35. Um, his FiO2 was recently raised to 65% just to maintain a saturation of 92%. So it's really, you know, it's 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 troubling in this particular case. And again, this, you know, just kind of doing it in my head, I didn't give a PO2, so we're really kind of you know guesstimating here, but it really looks like this particular patient's uh, PO2 is kind of hovering in that 100, rather the P to F ratio 100 to um, 120, something along those lines. Patient was started on Flowlon, full dose, uh, 10 micrograms per milliliter. Um, again, that flow we were mentioned earlier at eight milliliters per hour. Um, within six hours, pulmonary artery pressures decreased significantly. So note that they're not quite normal, but there's been a huge decrease. Cardiac output has bumped up nicely to 3.6. The saturation is 95% on a lower FiO2. So by starting the medication, it also allowed a downward titration of, of FiO2 as well. Within two days, other clinical indicators, including renal function, improved. You think about it, the reason why the renal function actually improved was many times patients will develop uh, multiple system in involvement or failure, you know, be, mainly because They've been in a um, hypoxemic state for such a long period of time that it, you know, has affected renal function, hepatic function, and other bodily function as well. Um, the patient was successfully extubated five days later. So this sounds a bit like nirvana. And clearly, clearly, there were uh, more uh, interventions that were done to this patient um, than what we're showing here. Um, the patient was undoubtedly started on certain medications, perhaps inotropic medication to increase the squeeze of the heart. They uh, probably were started on diuretics such as Lasix um, and you know, their I's and O's, meaning their fluid inputs and outputs were probably monitored very, very carefully. Um, but all of that said, um, the flow line uh, was, a, was a contributing factor to allow you know, uh, all of those things to happen and allow the, the patient's body itself to you know, aid along with uh, uh, overcoming this exacerbation of CHF. Now let's take a look at a, uh, the pulmonary use, pulmonary use of uh, Flowline. So in this case, we're, we're seeing a 57-year-old intubated, ventilated female post-trauma patient become septic and develop ARDS. May have been happening concomitantly. Bear in mind that sepsis, most partic particularly septic shock, 
is a big, you know, accounts for about a third of the mortality in the ICU. Um, and then when you kind of add uh, ARDS to that or vice versa, a patient has ARDS and you add, you know, sep sepsis and perhaps septic shock to it, it's a very, very bad combo. Her chest x-ray has a bilateral obtuse infiltrates, the, the classic, if you will, ground glass appearance. She has ref refractory hypoxemia, P to F ratio, um, which is less than 150, um, and airway pressures. And notice I didn't distinguish in this sentence here airway pressures as far as peaks and plateaus, but I'm going to say the airway pressures have increased. So the peak airway pressure increased um, to the mid 40s and plateaus have increased, you know, well into the 30s. Uh, and just to kind of review quickly with ARDSnet, okay, so ARDSnet makes recommendations regarding particularly plateau pressures. And they basically target plateau pressures that are um, equal to or less than 30, preferably, preferably equal to or, or less than 25, okay? So what's troubling in this particular case is this patient's peaks, but most particularly their plateaus are north of 30. She was switched uh, to pressure control ventilation. Um, and again, that's not hugely significant to this case. I tend to be a, a fan of pressure control or dual mode, but they were on volume and now they went to pressure control ventilation. Concomitantly, they were started on flow line, full dose flow line. Within uh, one day, um, the patient's P to F ratio increased to 245. So a normal P to F ratio is in the 400s. So the 245 is not normal, but clearly has you know, gotten a nice boost. Um, again, it, it was low before, it was less than 150, I didn't give you a precise number, but certainly it's gone up more than 100 points you know, in that period of time. The FiO2 success, has successfully been weaned to a safer, a much safer level of 50% from 75%. And now the ABGs are within acceptable limits. One week later, the patient is successfully extubated. So this sounds like nirvana. Again, like I said in the, in the uh, prior slide, it sounds like, oh, this is just too good to be true. But you know, that, it doesn't. That, this isn't the case in all cases. But it's not unreasonable to expect if you know the patient is being managed by a competent um, team of pulmonary critical care doctors and you know nurses and RTs. Um, and to have, you know, not just the flow line, but other, uh, you know, interventions at their disposal, it's not unreasonable to expect, or to, you know, more than hope, but to expect, um, you know, at least seven or eight out of 10 cases to end well for, for these patients, particularly if they're relatively young, such as this patient who's uh, 57 years old. As we conclude the presentation, I want to, um, if you will, leave you with some uh, take home points, if you will. So the use of inhaled flow line or eproprostenol is a promising and cost-effective therapy for the treatment of pulmonary hypertension and uh, hypoxia associated with ARDS. It also uh, again, can provide some benefit with our cardiac patients by, if you will, reducing right heart preload. So our, if you will, um, cardiac surgery patients in particular or patients that are candidates for ventricular assist devices and similar patients with, if you will, either elements of heart failure or those that have had their heart operated on and frankly have some grafts that need to kind of, if you will, less pressure imposed on them to reduce the chance of any sort of complications such as graft failure. However, the therapy, whether it be for a pulmonary use, a, a cardiac use, or some, you know, if you will, blend the therapy should be based on the selection of suitable patients. The proper procedures and training should be in place. So mainly the RTs and the doctors need to understand, you know, what the drugs are, what the delimitations are, um, the setup, um, things along those lines. And, and folks need to be properly trained and competent, competent in the use of, of these uh, medications. Um, continual therapy, um, you know, should, should be maintained until it's intentionally withdrawn because the half-life is so short and the, the total effect of uh, eproprostenol flow line is resolved within about 24 minutes. Um, we don't want any unintentional withdrawal or, you know, oh, we're just going to go down to CAT scan briefly and we'll be back so we don't need to, you know, it'll take us a half an hour, we'll be fine. That's not an acceptable approach. Um, however, further studies are required in order to determine the dose responsiveness and optimal, if you will, condition or conditions of utilization. 
and of course looking at the impact on survival of patients. As I mentioned a little bit earlier, the, the research on inhaled nitric oxide is a more mature. There's more of it, there's more powerful studies than, than is the case with Flowline. Um, however, the, the research in Flowlon is rapidly expanding, and I had shared a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of the research stemming back from the 1990s, where uh, it, was, it was experimented on with animals in the, in the early 2000s, where there's some of the early uh, research on, uh, on if you will, human patients, and then some of the more recent studies comparing Flowlon and nitric oxide and looking at Flowlon and its use in, in patients that have re respiratory failure associated with COVID-19. The pursuit of the use of Flowline requires a collaborative effort. And you could argue that collaboration is really key to not just the use of Flowline or inhaled nitric oxide, but really to a lot of things that we do. Critically, critically important. We know that effective communication and collaboration lies at the, at the root cause of many uh, you know, medical errors and, and quality issues, but it also lies at a lot of the fixes, okay? A lot of the remedies to those issues. So effective collaboration and communication critically important, including as it relates to inhaled nitric oxide. The last thing I, I wanna say is I am agnostic when it comes to inhaled nitric oxide versus flow on. I really am. I've used them both, I've used them a lot. Um, the only thing that, that I would suggest is if your facility uses inhaled nitric oxide and the, the, the conversation has not come up regarding the use of flow on, you know, epropostanol or other similar medications, it probably should. It's not. A, it's not a bad idea. So that you're making your your facility, your organization is making an informed decision. They both have advantages and disadvantages. Flow on has clearly has a cost advantage. It's in many patients, it is. You know, I would say nearly as effective as as inhaled nitric oxide. But nitric oxide again has more robust studies to back it up, um, and it also you know has features such as with the INO vent, the alarm. Um, system is, is pretty sophisticated and um, offers some advantages in that vein. Again, just staying informed um, is really the key in making the, the, the decision what kinds of, whether you're going to use the, again, the flow line or the inhaled nitric oxide. Just make it an informed one. So I want to conclude the presentation by sharing some references with you, including Egan's Fundamentals of Respiratory Care, which I am a, a, a co-editor on, um, has some really good information regarding uh, both inhaled nitric oxide as well as uh, uh, Flolon and, if you will, analog or cousin drugs. I've also included some other references here. The one I really want to point to you, or the two that I could really point to you that are most significant, and I would urge you to access if you're interested in learning more about this, would be the U.S. Uh, Food and Drug Administration where they actually talk about you know, a, a flow line in some significant detail, as well as uh, the flow line information um, center, which you can click on here and you can get some very, very useful information on the, the use of this uh, the drug and uh, more detail on you know, a lot of the information that I've covered in this presentation. With that, I wanna thank you all for uh, joining us today. I want to thank you for actually, if, you, if you're a repeat customer, for you know coming to us again. If you're new, for taking that bold step. Um, hopefully, you've uh, enjoyed this presentation, but more importantly, gotten some useful information from it, and that you come back uh, to us uh, yet again. Again, this is Dr. Al Hewer concluding today's presentation. Uh, thank you, and have a great day. Bye.